Hello, good morning, welcome back to the fish locker out on the boat. It is a lovely, lovely, lovely. <laughs> I went all Yorkshire for a second. It is a lovely day. Yeah, what I'm trying to do today, it's been a late start today. I've just done a school run, dropped James off, and I've come up to try for a couple of hours. In fact, actually, there's something to note there. You notice all the leaves that we've got down here? There has been an awful lot of, an awful lot of fresh water down. I'm going to take, uh, take advantage of the calm conditions and I'm going to try and get some freezer fodder. I'm going to try and get some pollock for the freezer. This time of year, you just have to take every weather wind opportunity you can do. I might not get a chance to go out to sea for another two weeks, so I'm going to try and get some fish. Yeah, I'm going to be fishing either soft plastics or jigs over areas of reef today. And we're just going to see how we can get on. I'm excited. Let's go! seeing quite a bit of feed down on the seabed. I don't know what it is yet. It could be little mackerel, it could be little pilchards. I'll try and find out. It's good to know what it's good to know what's down there as food, as feed. Because not only if I can catch some can I use some as live baits, but also it's good to know what everything's feeding on. Knowing what they're all feeding on will help me decide what lures I'm going to use. Oh, oh, there's a fish. Yeah, because if they're feeding on tiny, tiny sprats that are like an inch, two inch long, me using an eight or ten inch lure is not going to catch them. Because you have to try and match the hatch. Try and present to them a bait that looks like what they're already eating. This feels bigger, this feels like a scatter of mackerel. That is because it is a scad. Horse mackerel. Sticking that live bait tank. Whoa, which he knows. This first drift that I'm doing here, I don't really call it a sacrificial drift. This is just figuring out what's happening. This is figuring out which way I'm going to drift, how fast I'm going to drift, what direction. Because I want to long, I want to run as long a drift as possible over this area of reef. So depending which way I'm drifting, the next time round I'll position myself so I drift over a lot of it. We are drifting at 0.4 knots. That is slow enough, I think, to get away with using a slow jig. So I'm going to switch my when this stops messing me around. I'm going to switch my soft plastic to a slow jig let's try a little slow jig instead then when the tide picks up a little bit i'll go back to the lures yeah we're pretty much bang on slack water now as the tide starts flowing i'm expecting the drift to pick up to about one one and a half knots Well, that's what they are. Teeny tiny mackerel. I didn't want that one. That's, that's really good, that. Not only now do I know that it's little mackerel, but also they're about that big, which are the same size as my lures. So I've, I've got some live baits and I've also I've got a rough idea of how big the baits need to be. Because I know roughly which way I'm going to drift now, and as the drift is just starting to pick up, what I've done is I've rigged one of those little tiny mackerel on the boat. The float is just sat at the back of the boat, over there. And all we're going to do is we're going to run the same drift across that piece of reef, and I'm float fishing one of the little tiny mackerel and I'm going to continue to fish a jig. So the jig is going to be bouncing tight on the seabed and the float is going to be suspending a bit. Predatory fish like pollock and bass, they're generally, they're more active, they, they feed more, they've got more chance of catching them when there's a bit of tide running. It's just the way that predator fish move. I mean, ah, I believe that they take part of their energy from the water around them. 
when it's slack tide or when it when it's when it is slack tide either high water or slack or low water slack when it's high water slack or low water slack they don't move at all I've been in the water diving with them and they just kind of hang there in the stasis and as soon as the tide starts to kick through again they sort of like switch on again so yeah, I'm waiting, waiting for like 15, 20 minutes for the tide to start pushing and all fish that are there, I know they're there, should start coming on the feed. That little bit of breeze, that breeze has just picked up, it's maybe about two mile an hour and it's spun us right round there. Got it. Oh, it is a ras, <laughs> a big ras. Felt it thumping at it. Yeah. You wouldn't believe it all this far, <laughs> this far out at sea. I've just had a cobweb blow onto my face. There's going to be some bite marks in that lure now when I bring it up. Still going, but yeah, he's been chomped. It's a ballon rust, that. Watch now. Oh, all happens at once, doesn't it? Oh no, we've got it. Not what I was expecting, but also quite a nice surprise. There's the live bit, there's the bass. <laughs> you get a better proof that it works than that, do you? I'm going to get my disgorger out on him because he's taking that circle up to the back of his throat. Yeah, beauty fish. There we are. Hook's all out of him. Now this one here is probably just bang on legal size. And we have a couple of days left of the bass season. But I'll let this guy go instead. A lovely little silver. You need to be careful though, because they are covered in spikes. You can see them there on top of the dorsal. On the back of here, they've got some spikes. Now, if you're going to hold them, see what I'm holding there? I'm not actually touching the gills. It just runs up inside the gill, inside the gill cover. Boom, blooming spider webs today. Yeah, let's go back. First fish, but just wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> it's still nice to catch though. I'm sure you're that live bait rig now. Show you it with a dead fish. <laughs> Effectively, it's a dead bait rig now. Yeah, all I've got is you've got a large sliding float, one of my fish locker locked in leads, and then a hook length of about three to four feet of fluoro ending in. I think this is a 6-0 and it's a Coxon Royal Mudsug Circle. 
and all I do is I just took my little joey and just went in with the, this this fish is dead now <laughs> went in and hooked up just just forward between the eyes like that and just cast it out and let it drift down next to the boat simple but really effective circle hooks as well stop the hooks from going really deep this one actually when it swallowed that little mackerel it got it hooked just inside of the mouth the hook was just out of the way so all i did was i really gently went in through the gills went in between the gills with my little homemade disgorger just turned the hook and popped it there you go let's go and see if we can't find some pollock As it is, that kind of all just happened all at once. Float bobbed down at the same time that I got a bite on this, struck into it and got it snagged, and it got wrapped round the other rod down there. <laughs> so, yeah. Just goes to show, no matter how well prepared you are, it always manages to find a way of tangling up and going wrong. Now, all I got was I just got a bob on the float, the float went straight under. And I think that one, it, bass, like I say, they have got a spike on the back of the gill. Let me just try and. Bass have got a spike at the back of their gill and what they do is they'll come up and smack stuff with it, smack their prey with the side of their gill plate to try and stun it and kill it. Yeah, they, um, they hit prey fish with the side of their gill and then come back round to get it once it's been stunned. And I think that's what happened there. I think it had come up and hit the live bait and that's when we'd seen the original bob then come back round to get it. You're looking for two types of bite when you're fishing with a float. A positive bite or a negative bite. Positive bite being that the float disappears under the water. So a fish has picked it up and swore for it. A negative bite or a drop back bite is when the float, instead of sitting up in the water, lays flat on top. That means that something has picked up the bait and the weight and come up in the water. So the float, there's no longer any weight on the float, so it lays flat. There are limits on the bass that you can take. And uh, <laughs> yeah, there can be confusion sometimes because some parts of the year you can catch bass and keep them. And other times of the year you have to catch and release. And when I release a video and someone watches it in the period of time where you're not allowed to take them, they're all get upset and like, oh, you shouldn't have taken that. I was like, mm, the, the video wasn't filmed when you're watching it. Type of thing. Yeah, actually the, um, the bass season, they have a closed season around winter, which is when they breed. Close seasons in like three days. So I could have legally kept it, I just chose not to. Carry this drift on for maybe another hundred yards. We're going to try another reef because this just isn't working. Literally, first drop on the first drift of this new reef. Managed to get himself all snarled up with that live bait rig as well. There you go. And typical. Yeah, we would be facing straight into the sun. <laughs> That's a little bit better. Too small. Where's my cloth? Where's my cloth? Whoa. Feels like a heavy fish this. If it's not foul hooked, this feels like a heavy fish.
Gently does it. Oh my word! <laughs> I did think that this might be what it was, but this is an absolute beauty. Crikey! Now that <laughs> you don't see many this size. Look at the size of that for a ballon ras. Look at the size of that for a ballon ras. <laughs> now this guy, he did come up quite quick, so he has got a bit of air in him. He's got a little bit of air in him. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put him in my live bait tank and try and depressurise him and then send him back with a descender. That is an absolutely monster ballon ras. <laughs> colours on it as well. If you can see colours in its tail. Unfortunately, today's just going to be one of those days where the sun does not want to play. Let's see if we can't twist us around that way a little bit. Yeah, that, <laughs> that ballon ras, that ballon ras is just recovering in that live bait tank of mine. But look what he's done to me lure. So I've changed it for another one. All I'm gonna do is, when he's had five or 10 minutes in there to recover, I've, all you do is you very, very carefully just pop them with like a, the end of a hook or a needle. And it allows them to dissipate all the air that's trapped inside of them. And then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a descender to take him back to the seabed. He should be all right. But yeah, that is an absolutely cracking ballon rust. That's, uh, <laughs> if I had some scales with me, that would more like more likely be like a six pound ballon rust. It's not a pollock though, is it? This is a descender. What it is, so you attach that to your main line, attach this top part to your main line, you've got a lead on here. This little hook, this little point here, just goes like through the through the fish's lip and then you lower it down and the weight carries the fish to the seabed and all you do is you just jig it a couple of times the fish falls off there and it's back down to depth when we get back over the area of reef where I caught it from I let it go oh no. just a little tiny pollock a little baby pollock. Just doing them getting a bit bigger, couldn't I? We'll see about putting that rasp back. Right. Like I say, you just connect these descenders to the bottom of your line like that. What an absolute beauty it is. Don't get many that big. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this just through the side of his lip. Oh, it's tough. There you go. Just through the side of his lip. Just let the lead take it all the way to the seabed. There, look. Now it's at the seabed. All you need to do is give it a couple of real good jokes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to record off my. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to record off my off my GPS. You can see that fish being carried down to the seabed. There's me happily drifting along. And when you look onto the plotter, that line that you can see coming from the top to the bottom, that's the fish being carried to the seabed. As you can see, I just gently lowered it down all the way till it got to the bottom. Gave it a couple of jigs, the fish came off, and I just wound my rig back in. There, look. 
So that descender's carried it all the way to the seabed where it's back to pressure. And a couple of good jigs takes it off and it stays down there and you really rig back up. It's quite often what happens to fish sometimes. Some fish are worse for others. Some fish are worse for it than others. And that's been that they suffer with barotrauma. If you bring them up from the seabed too quickly, like what had happened to that ras, is they get what they get like the bends. The, the, the air that's in their swim bladder hasn't got enough time to be able to decompress, to be able to be expelled. So they end up full of air. And one of the problems about them being full of air Yeah, one of the problems about them being full of air is they can't get back to depth. So all that descender does, it just helps them get down there. And now I've got snagged on the bottom. Too busy talking, not paying attention to what I'm doing. I'm snagged on the seabed, so I'm gonna have to steam back up tide and try and pull it out. There we go. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it doesn't. Sun's really starting to get on my nerves now. Yeah, what happens is, because we're drifting that way, and my snag had gone in that way, trying to pull it out, you just pull it deeper into the snag. So you go back up tide and try and pull it out the way that it went in. Got a slightly bent hook now. We go. Given the option, I'd rather the hook bends than snaps. Mm. Couldn't, couldn't see the float for a second then. Eh? You know when I said I couldn't see the float and I thought, oh! That's because a squid's had hold of it, look. See, it's been chewed up here. Yeah, so it wasn't a fish, it was a squid. Which is why, when I wound down and lifted into it, there was no fish there. The squid, obviously, when it felt some resistance, just let go. One last go. I do enjoy fishing at this time of year, but I tell you what, it is hard work. <laughs> it is hard work at this time of year. We're on a bit of a half and half tide. It's not a spring and it's not a neap. If it was a neap tide, I would be out on the wrecks, and if it was a spring tide, I would be, I'd be doing something else. We're just trying to make the best of a nice day. One. I just want one nice pollock. I want a pollock of about four or five pound. I don't know. I wouldn't shake one off that was eight pound, but yeah, I would prefer the one that was about four or five pound. It's really nice to see that monster balanrass. That was that was a beauty. They're, uh, they're not a good eating fish. You can eat them, you can eat most things. You can eat them, but they're not a good eating fish. And they're very slow growing as well. Ooh, missed it. They're important for the ecosystem, for, they're important for the marine ecosystem as well, because they, they eat all things like lice. Lice and little parasites. So they keep all them down. In fact, the Scottish, uh, Scottish salmon farms there is a live wrasse fishery down here in Cornwall. It's, it's quite tightly regulated now. The, uh, the salmon farms, instead of putting loads of chemicals in with the salmon to be able to kill the lice, what they were doing was they were buying live wrasse from fishermen and putting the wrasse in there and the wrasse were eating all the lice of the salmon. Yeah. If that's all I'm catching, I'm not going to be sticking around here. 
Yeah, it is all I'm getting is balling, Ross. There's a couple there that have had a strike at me. I bet when I bring it up, there's going to be loads of bite marks in the low. Mullered it. Chewed it to absolute pieces. Can't see where the float is. Oh, can't see for the sun. In the net. In the net. Now that. Oh yeah, John, get a rubber net. You don't get caught up, Mr. Dill. That is a lovely fish. And I am actually, I'm going to take it. <laughs> if I caught anything else. I would have kept that instead but all I've caught is one nice bass so I'm going to keep this instead I had I just got off the phone with my wife I've got to go and pick my little boy up from school so I've got about another 20 minutes I've just said to Hannah then I just said look unless I catch another fish it's going to have been kind of a wasted day. Oh no, don't you dare. Drop straight into a snag. Fantastic. Drop straight into a snag. Some days are just sent to test you. Yeah, I'd, I'd said earlier on in the video when I released that smaller bass that I wasn't going to take any. And I fished all day for a pollock and not found any. And I'd, I'd kind of said to my wife, I was like, look, I'm going to fish for like another 15 minutes. And if I don't catch anything, I'm going to come straight in. And not <laughs> two minutes after putting the phone down did I have that bass. Now I believe in signs, unfortunately Mr. Bass. Yeah, the signs point to me keeping it. Just to show folks, so that you don't, <laughs> you don't get upset about me taking that bass out of a closed season. It is the 29th. Bass season ends on the 30th. Last day for taking bass is the 30th. The live bait does it again. Yeah, look, that wasn't even a live bait, that was a dead bait. That was an, <laughs> that was an X live bait. Just at the back of its, well, yeah, just at the back of its throat. Little tiny schoolie to finish. What I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use my little homemade disgorger. I'll show you real quickly how I'm gonna do that. 
first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the trace off. There, look. So it's just the trace. Now the hook is inside of its mouth. So I'm going to go in through the gill on this side. Yeah. Go in through the gill on this side. And I'm going to take the hook out through there. There, look. See? That's it. And then I'll just pull the swivel through. Like that. Ah! Managed to go all the way through that. He waited until I got the hook out and then decided he was going to spike me for it. There's gratitude for you. Yeah, so all I did was I just used my little homemade disgorger. Went through a gap between the gills like that. Went round the hook and pulled the hook out through the gills. Right, we'll see you later, mate. Time to go. I'm cutting it pretty fine. I've slowed down just long enough to be able to talk to you. I'm on my way back in now. Yeah, I've got an hour and a quarter before I need to pick James up from school. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I fished it until the very last. Um, that bass, two days before the end of the season, yeah. I believe in signs and that fish was meant to come home with me. All I did was, I've dispatched it and I'm bleeding it in there. Now I'm not going to show you that, if you want to know how to do that, what you need to Google is the Ig Jimmy method. If I've got enough time when I get in, I'm going to scale it and then fillet it. If I haven't, then I'm going to take it home, put it in the fridge, and I'm going to scale it and fillet it tomorrow. I hope you've enjoyed joining me, hope you found it interesting. All the very best. See you later.